Hey everyone, in this video we're going to continue on with section 3.2 where we talk about the theoretical results for second order linear equations. So in this video we're going to talk about how we know that the infinite family we got in the last video is actually enough to get us every initial condition we want. So let's go ahead and jump right into that. So in the last video, we saw that from two solutions, we could get, infinite, we could get an, infinite, an infinite family of solutions. Right, so we saw that if I have two solutions to Ly equals zero, then I can get infinite family if I just take constants and multiply that by the two functions there. Now, you should be a little bit concerned if I was to say that no matter what, this is enough to get every solution. Because what's to stop me from picking y1 equals y2? Right, one function should not give me enough to solve for any initial conditions because I have two different initial conditions I can vary independently. So I shouldn't be able to solve if I only have one function. So I need two functions and I somehow need to make sure that those two functions are different enough in the proper way that I can meet every initial condition. So we need y1 and y2 to be different enough so that I can satisfy my initial conditions. So let's look at what I mean by that. So if I have initial conditions, y of t0 equals y0, and y prime of t0 equals y prime 0, and I want my y to be of the form in the set above, what has to happen? Well, then I have to have that c1 y1 of t0 plus c2 y2 of t0 equals y0 and c1 y1 prime of t0 plus c2 y2 prime of t0 equals y prime of 0 because this is y of t0 and this is y prime of t0. Now I want to know when I can solve for the coefficients c1 and c2 in this system of equations here. And I want this to work for arbitrary y0 and y0 prime. So I'm not going to work through the details here, but if you go through the elimination method to try to solve this system of equations, you multiply one by a thing and the proper coefficients to add to the other one to try to eliminate one of the variables, what you find is that as long as this combination, y1 t0, y2 prime t0 minus y1 prime t0, y2 of t0, as long as this is not 0, then I can solve the system of equations for c1 and c2 to make this work. Now this thing is so important in the fact that this thing is 0 that we give it a name. It's usually given the letter w, and it's called the Ronskian of our two solutions y1 and y2. This is called the Ronskian of our solutions y1 and y2. So the result we see here is that if w is not 0, then I can meet any initial conditions. This here is the content of theorem 3.2.3 which I'm going to write up for you and then show you why it's what it, why it is what it is. All right, so there are a lot of words here, but the idea is what I just said. So if we have two solutions and two initial conditions, then we can pick our constants that both solve the equation and have the initial conditions if and only if my Ronskin is not zero at that point. So in this case, they are viewing the Ronskin as a function, which you can view it either way, either as a number at a point, you can view it as a function of t, and you can plug in t zero to see what you get for that value. So the next theorem tells us a little bit more. What it really says, the next theorem, 3.2.4, says is that if there's any point in my interval where the Ronskin of these two functions is not zero, then I get every solution I want on the entire interval. Basically means I can pick that point where they're non-zero as my initial condition, and I just get every solution from there. Because as long as everything's still continuous, I can push everything out from there. And by uniqueness, that's all I can get. Because for any two solutions, they both have this point t0. And if I solve the equation there, I get the same result just because I can't have different solutions with the same two values at one point. 
This is the same idea from first order of solutions not being able to cross. In this point, it means that for any value t0, I can never have two different solutions that both match in position and derivative at a certain point. So that's what 3.2.4 tells us, and it basically motivates our term general solution for this setup. Because for any initial data I want, I can get a solution of this form. So this form, c1, y1, plus c2, y2, is our general solution in the same sense as it was before. So because these guys are so nice and important, we also have a special name for this y1 and y2. So we call y1 and y2 a fundamental set of solutions if the Ronskian of y1 and y2 is not zero. So if they satisfy this property where I can pick the constants to be the initial, the initial condition, we call these two guys a fundamental set of solutions. Now, while it might be hard to find these solutions in general, like actually solving for them, they do always exist. And that comes from the fact that we have our existence and uniqueness theorems. So this is, the, this is theorem 3.2.5 kind of loosely stated. So consider y1 and y2 solving the following initial value problems. L of y1 equals 0, y1 at t0 equals 1, y1 prime at t0 equals 0, L of y2 equals 0, y2 at t0 equals 0, y2 prime at t0 equals 1, then these guys are a fundamental set of solutions then you can calculate the Ronskian of y1 and y2 is just 1 minus 0 equals 1. So they are a fundamental set of solutions. The point is fundamental set of solutions always exist, and you can find them just by using this sort of approach here to give you a set of fundamental, a fundamental set of solutions. All right, those are the main points here for this video. The idea being that this Ronskian thing is important because it lets us say that if I have two functions whose Ronskian is not zero and they both solve my equation, then I can get any solution I want to the equation with any initial data just from those two functions. And this sort of motivates our calculation from before because we had two solutions to our equations. We had our two exponentials from section 3.1. Now what this says and what you'll calculate in this problem that you're doing today on this worksheet is that the Ronskian of those guys is not zero which means that they generate a fundamental set of solutions and they encompass every solution you could get to this ODE in the domain we care about. So I'll wrap this problem for you. It involves computing a specific round scan. So you'll do that. And then that'll at least give you an idea of how this works and why the modular calculus from last time were actually a good idea. So I'll put that up for you right now. All right, so here's your problem for this video. Um, I want you to find the round scan of these two functions. Basically just do, find the formula, just plug it into the formula and see what you get. In this case, I want you to leave the t0 in there, and at the end, you're going to evaluate t equals 0 to make sure it's not 0. All right, thanks a lot for watching. In the next video, we'll, i got one more point to cover, and then we'll talk about a couple examples of using this to find solutions, to find general solutions, to find fundamental sets of solutions, and then doing the interval existence stuff like we did for first-order equations. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.